So hello everybody, we're back for another episode of Out of Band. I'm Anne Leslie. My name is Jennifer Winnegars. And my name is Faith. And today we have another amazing guest. We are joined by Magda Lydia Celli, who is in Singapore. Um, polyglot, PhD, all around just amazing woman in cyber. And the topic that we're going to be talking about today is cyber risk management. Now I'm going to come clean when, you know, I kind of come from a risk management background. Um, when, when we, you know, Faith suggested this topic, it's super important. I'm not denying it's not, it really is, but I kind of went, but Then we had to think about it and realize that Magda comes at this topic from a really, really interesting angle. Um, now, okay, I'm, I hope I'm not offending risk managers all around the world. It, this is a really important topic, no matter how you do it. Um, but Magda does something and has a particular blend of skills. Um, we're gonna be talking about them. It's sort of offensive cyber skills. Um, and it's why, how and why this brings a totally new dimension to, to cyber risk management. So Magda, welcome. We're totally pumped to have you with us today. Mm -hmm. um, could you tell us just a little bit about yourself? Leslie, thank you so much. Um, really, really appreciate the inv invitation. And I'm really super happy to be here with all the wonderful women in cyber. It's absolutely fascinating. And I think, you know, from our first meeting, we have the opportunity now as well to exchange virtually again between Singapore and France and now other countries as well in Europe. What an amazing, again, opportunity. Now, if I start with actually a very quick introduction about myself. So Magda Shelley, like you mentioned, I'm based in Singapore. Uh, I am, however, originally from Poland and I have as well Tunisian blood. So I'm mixed and half Polish, half Tunisian. And I have lived in five different countries, uh, including France, where I got my PhD uh, in telecommunication engineering. It wasn't directly in cyber. But for the funny story, when I was actually performing my research, you know, trying to find the new indoor positioning system that will actually address GPS indoors and fix all the problems of the world, right? I got bored. And I try to find different things to do. And those different things included as well, looking at security and looking at areas that would be more fascinating from the perspective they were changing very much and very quickly. So from that perspective, of course, I discovered and I started really being passionate about cyber. But even before in my studies as a telecommunication engineer, I had information security, of course, within my studying, I said, I had as well coding. So I was like building some applications, etc. Of course, all that was history at some point within my career. And then I needed to look at it back and just get that hands on again. But why the story comes or why I start introducing myself from that perspective is that my background comes from not directly the traditional cybersecurity. I have not decided when I was 18 years old, oh, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna either be a hacker or cybersecurity professional or help companies protect themselves. That wasn't even a discussion. When I was 18, there was a choice between either business or either technology engineering, that's it. I had two choices and my parents decided, and this is, you know, the reality, for me that I was way too good in physics and math. So I needed to be an engineer and that's what happened. <laughs> so, but again, because I really like business, I always had a blend between engineering and business. And I will stop here the introduction so we can go further into the, uh, the topic of today, which is cyber risk management. Yeah, so just, you know, Going into the topic, what exactly is cyber risk management and how do you approach it? Because most people will be like, cyber risk management, uh, compliance, uh. Yeah. TRC, so, yeah. So Thank what you, is Faith. it? Yeah. 
Thank you, Faith, for raising the question. I think it's a very, very important question. Why we see cyber risk management very often perceived as, yeah, a compliance task or something that someone needs to do to ensure that it's done there on Excel, review it perhaps uh, once a year if they don't forget about it, let's be realistic, or maybe they get a, a software that will update actually that list of risks <laughs> every quarter, every year. Now, the fundamental problem with cyber risk management is already the definition of risk. And when we look at it from our cybersecurity industry, that's where it gets even more fundamentally challenging. Now, why do I mention that? Because when we discuss about risk management, forgetting about the cyber aspect, we realize that there is a much bigger history. There are methods and management process that has been built for a much longer time comparing to cyber risk management. And that also leads to the fact that it's more mature and aligned with the enterprise risk management as a whole, looking at the business. Now, if we go into the cyber risk management, that's where the fundamental definition of cyber risk depends on who you're talking to. If you are discussing with a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer, they might actually answer and mention a cyber risk that is relevant to the business. If you're talking with an information security manager or someone perhaps further technical, you might hear areas like or definitions that are more aligned with the cyber threat rather than the cyber risk. Now, if you go even further, you might consider completely different risks management when it comes to vulnerability management. And then the findings will be considered as risks that they will be addressed and described and then shared with the business. Now, of course, that means that we don't have a complete homogeneous description and definition that is used by our community or by the industry. And therefore, when we mention cyber risk, it might mean anything to anyone. Yeah, and I think it boils down to technical risk and business risk, right? Uh, just being able to, to articulate the risk to diff two different um, people. Absolutely. And there is a very uh, important aspect of technical risk. You need to be able as well to have a certain visibility and, of course, uh, the rating and the severity of the risk. But at the end, if you are managing cyber risk for a business, the technical risk will not help you to have that discussion with the business. Because if you mention anything about technical concepts, they will not exactly understand. Goodbye. <laughs> exactly, immediately. Like apparently it's seven seconds where people actually keep the focus. Mm -hmm. After seven seconds, they just like either switch away or they will listen to you. So you don't have a long, <laughs> a long time. I mean, you just mentioned something very interesting because um, having been in this industry for a while, it, it kind of, interests me and also sometimes frustrates me that some people still confuse the the term threat with actual risk could you maybe uh, elaborate a bit more on that from your standpoint absolutely jennifer I, I think this is something that happens again unfortunately and i really would like to still re-emphasize that very often and way too often when we hear for example, on webinars or discussions between security professionals and business, we might hear, yeah, you are at risk of ransomware. The ransomware is a type of malware. It's a cyber threat. The ransomware by itself will not mean or will not actually lead to a risk unless it is actually a cyber threat that is exploited by using a vulnerability leading to successful cyber attack. The successful cyber attack might consequently lead to a cyber risk or a materialization of the cyber risk. 
And again, by bringing those concepts of, oh, malware, phishing, ransomware, and presenting them as risks, we are confusing the business and we are making it very difficult for them to understand what actually can happen to them as a business, what can, are the consequences on their operations, activities, and why especially they need to care. Yeah, I totally agree. And coming from a technical background, I must say that from our side, it tends to be very difficult to articulate yeah. what the hell is the problem? Because we'll say, oh yeah, there's ransomware, you know, we expect people to start jumping, but we don't see them jumping and we're like, why are they not jumping? It's <laughs> ransomware. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so um I, I, I try to uh, I try to even tell the people near me like, OK, so it's run somewhere. So what? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, what is the bigger picture? How does it impact us? Why should we be jumping? You know, uh, tell it to me in words or tell it to tell it to someone who does not understand the technical jargon, what exactly the risk is. What why is it important to them? I think that's that's something that we as you know, people in the industry need to really remember um, mm -hmm. when articulating these problems. Yeah, that's actually it's an anecdote on that, right? So I had a conversation with somebody last week um, because the cyber topic, I think it's worldwide, but particularly in Europe right now, it's kind of getting swallowed a little bit into a wider topic of operational resiliency. Mm -hmm. And what um, the person I was talking to said to me was, my team is really struggling right now to move from the technical lens of what they've always done mm -hmm. to communicating in a language, exactly what you were saying, Faith, right? Communicating in a language of this thing that we know is really important, the impact. And it's really actually difficult, I think, because of the way we work and organizations are structured, identifying the impact, you can only do that if you can see how systems are intertwined and how they support business workflows. And there are very few organizations that I've come across that have a good mapping of what their actual <laughs> business workflows yeah. and are able to prioritize them by criticality. Because you can't start talking about impact until you kind of know what will make your business collapse, right? Because yeah. you could have ransomware on a system, but it could turn out to be inconvenient as opposed to catastrophic. But yeah, and, also, and ransomware is just malware at the end of the day, you yeah. know. So, <laughs> but I mean, that translation also usually gets lost because of the, the the position that security usually has within an organization. It is a function that is usually just there either to comply uh, with with legislation, for example, or just to tick off several boxes, or because, for example, stakeholders uh, have have demanded that specific function within an organization. Um, whereas if you have security really as a joint effort within an organization, then it actually helps with understanding that risk, understanding the threats, and also helping to translate that to actual business language. Yeah, and Jennifer, I think you touched a topic that is not only critical, but it's actually a challenge worldwide. When yeah. we look at, for example, Asia specifically, we have only 10% of companies having a chief information security officer. 10%. That's low. <laughs> that is extremely low. Yeah. And I have been working with companies uh, in this part of the world where they still absolutely believe that the IT is in charge of cybersecurity. They lack completely the visibility and understanding that cyber is a different domain that requires different skills. Mm -hmm. So there is a different kind of challenge in general, I'm repeating myself, but I would say the maturity across the regions is not the same. And therefore the way of how we address cyber risk within those organizations will vary as well. Now, that immediately means that the reporting of the cyber security will be as well different, even if they have someone in charge of cyber security yep. and that if the person is not reporting to the right decision maker might actually lead to more challenges in the, the implementation and identification of cyber risk management so yeah there is many many aspects that require that maturity that we see with the traditional enterprise risk management mm 
-hmm. that we should all continue, you know, raising awareness about, because again, starting from the fundamental definition that I actually really like how we address from different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And then from the fact that if you don't have the right organization and the right stakeholders involved, mm -hmm. you are actually not addressing business risk that might actually happen due to technology or basically what we can call otherwise cyber risk. And just to add as well on what Anne, you mentioned, uh, the part of the impact. When we talk about cyber risk, there is a fundamental need to understand the business. Mm -hmm. And one aspect that I really like to discuss with people in charge of cyber risk, I will advise them and recommend them to read the financial reporting of the companies for whom they're working for. Why? Because you will see then what's the priority for the business. What is the main product that is generating the most of the revenue? Eventually, for certain financial as well reports, there will be a very clear list of business risks. Mm -hmm. And that allows you as well to understand further where the business is focused today and how you can have a discussion with the business stakeholders that is aligned with the business. At the end, the business is there to generate money. We cannot tell them, oh, you are producing uh, yogurt. Oh, no, forget about that. Just do cybersecurity. <laughs> no, it needs to be like co-aligned with the actual end goal of the business. In fact. Yeah. And, and I think another problem is that the fact that security is, is not an income generating business, right? It's more of a support function. It costs money. Yeah. Well, Faith, I think, you know, I wouldn't, I don't look at it from that perspective, honestly. When I talk about cyber risk, for me, I look at it from an ROI, but from the losses that a business can um, incur, basically. When a cyber risk materializes, let's take a practical example. A company becomes a victim of a massive cyber attack involving a ransomware. The business risk is a complete interruption of their activities, operations across several sites. What does it really mean for the business? Loss of revenue, loss of profit, mm -hmm. additional costs, financial losses associated with the recovery of their operations. Eventually, over time, employee salaries, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So perhaps you don't see it from the perspective of bringing customers, but you need to look at it from the perspective that if you don't implement it, you yeah. might have losses that will impact your cash flow, your liquidity, and incur as well very, very big financial losses mm -hmm. that if you're not prepared to tackle will actually lead to very big challenges for the business. Yeah, I agree. Very clear. <laughs> so on that, right, as a segue into um, the, the offensive capabilities that I, I, I know Jennifer and well, all three of us actually are really curious to hear more about, there's this, you know, the kind of the camp of the organizations that manage security as a compliance exercise and at the risk of telling people listening, you know, to suck eggs, it's, you're not, you're not secure because you're compliant. Um, and one of the things that I've noticed about uh, risk management, irrespective of whether it's cyber risk or risk management, enterprise risk management, is that you can do a lot of busy work, right? You can be constantly busy doing stuff whether or not that stuff you're doing is actually effective or useful in any way is open to debate. <laughs> um, now, it's one of the frequent gripes about security is we see no value. Now, mm -hmm. it's a bit frustrating as a practitioner because a lot of what we do is avoiding something bad happening. So we're kind of being asked to demonstrate value on something that we've prevented happening. So the thing that didn't happen, it's invisible. But what I think we are striving to do as an industry is do things that are more useful. And that requires making choices. And one of the fundamental things that a lot of companies really struggle with is 
how do I make the choice? How do I know what to focus on? And that kind of comes back to, well, knowing what I have in my organization that other people might want, knowing where, knowing where the money is in terms of what keeps my business churning, um, knowing where I'm vulnerable. And that comes back to what you were saying about threat is not equal to risk. But we'd love to hear more about what it is in terms of the skill set you have, because you do have a very, you've done your OSCP. Um, so t- could you tell just our listeners who may not be familiar with that, what it is and what it allows you to do differently in a risk management context compared to somebody who might have a much more GRC, pure GRC orientation? Yeah. So thank you, Anne, for, the, for this question. I think definitely is something that brought a lot of different perspective. Again, it's about perspective and using the right knowledge with the right stakeholders. So I'll come back onto you know, understanding uh, the business aspect and how do I do it at, at least and what is the feedback that I got. But just to clarify, I have booked my OSCP for I think 100 times, I'm the best client, but I never managed to have the time to sit for it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so maybe at the time of the webinar being live, maybe I will be already having the time because I have some free time now scheduled. <laughs> <laughs> But coming back to, you know, uh, what you mentioned around clearly defining the value for someone who is within the business and ensuring that they understand the consequences is very important. And it's very important by not telling them, hey, you're going to be hacked tomorrow. Your whole business is going to be down. That doesn't work. It's not even realistic. So... Again, if you go and read the first step, read very clearly the financial statesman, understand where are the business priorities, Mm -hmm. and then focusing on the business priorities and the areas that are generating the most of the revenue, you then take the next step by clearly identifying how those main generating revenue might be impacted by a cyber event. Now, of course, that seems pretty clear, right? But understanding that as well and translating it from a possible cyber attack to a discussion with a business stakeholder is still a challenge. Why? Because we might be talking about a product like, I like this example, manufacturing yogurts, right? So if that's the main product of your company and you're trying to build cyber search capabilities, how are you going to tell them that, look, if you don't do this, you might lose money. You need to really investigate the potential, not only attack surface, but as well entry point that might go beyond the traditional IT surface or enterprise traditional exposures. So that leads me to what you mentioned as well, Anne, is like to understand not only your weaknesses and vulnerabilities, but also to very clearly identify that you might not be able to have a clear grasp of all of them. And often uh, companies come and say, yeah, but we have done a penetration testing on this particular web application that is a critical asset for us. And, you know, we are all good. Mm. And I ask a simple question. Who is providing that application? Oh, we have outsourced it to a vendor. What about good. your vendor management? Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, nothing. How do you manage to ensure that compiled code is actually not bringing any vulnerability or that you just don't have a backdoor in there that allows the cyber criminal to get in. It's That's not going to be detected by a penetration testing. That is only being able to be detected if you perform a code source analysis or review, yeah. which is very rarely done. So there are a lot of ways that you can actually come and link that particular business scenario, product, service. However, it does require putting yourself in the business shoes. They are not there to 
be the most secure business. They yeah. are there to ensure the activities of the business continue yeah. and the best way at the lowest cost possible so they can generate profit. Yeah. And if you're able to show that, you will able to have the right conversation. And you actually touch upon a very interesting part because, uh, for example, there was a report released by ANISA, the European Cybersecurity Agency, uh, earlier this year, which actually stated that uh, in 2020, uh, supply chain attacks actually increased significantly and were also way more advanced than, than in all previous years. So focusing on also that, that external aspect and not just your internal risk management, I think that is extremely important to just highlight here. Well, Jennifer, there is also some uh, particular scenario that I really like to bring uh, and make people think, you know, when they listen to this webinar, uh, when you have a mobile application, for example, so you ensure that you have all the security, you say, no, we have a penetration testing, we have everything um, already in place to ensure that it's not gonna be compromised. And I'm like, okay, and who's gonna publish it on your Android like store or on Google Play? Oh, your developer in that particular, uh, do they have to factor to fact authentication on that account? Oh no, okay, great. And what happens if they get compromised? And then there's no answer. Yeah. So the extent of the way of how an advanced cyber attack could happen, it's not by getting through the main door. It's yeah. finding the weaknesses oh. of the company. And also the, and, the organizations that they cooperate together with or have outsourced several activities of themselves. Yeah. Absolutely. So, Faith, I, go on. I know you have questions on this, right? Yeah. <laughs> The hunter that you are, right? So, I mean, yeah. So, I guess my question would be this: um, since I'm a hunter, right? Uh, you've given good advice that I need to go and read the, um, you know, the financial reporting and see what what the the business considers important. Um. However, for, from uh, assessing, uh, that, that will be done, that will be done, don't worry. But from uh, assessing the current landscape, right? We tend to be in, in our own little bubbles. Um, as an example, if let's say you see that your business keeps getting attacked by um, some, some, some form of attack, let's say um, I want to change, let's say the attack, the attack vector is um, that we just have overly permissive applications uh, running on our local computers. And I would like to change that, right? How can I go to the stakeholder and explain that to them? How would you say that? I think faith, uh, this is not only a very important question, but I do think that is a $1 million worth question, you know, if we have the perfect <laughs> answer and you just do it and deploy it. All the CISOs and the cybersecurity professionals will be so happy. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do I do it? Yeah, when do I go it? to a company, which actually where I find out that the culture is not ensuring cybersecurity at all kind of processes and not with them all departments. First, for me, what is really important is I need to create that relationship with the person in charge of those people. So who is working with them and why actually there wasn't anything implemented. So understand that person, understand what would be the major challenge if we implement certain restrictions? Because again, if we're talking especially around developers, they need to use certain tools so they feel frustrated if they are unable to download or use certain tools because they need an yeah. IT admin approval. So understanding what are the main priorities of the key employees in that particular department is really important. You cannot just go and say, okay, 
I'm gonna stop, stop. done. You know, I don't care if you need to download anything. That's my decision. I'm in cybersecurity. No, oh. that doesn't work. However, if you actually try to discuss and understand more, you might be able to produce a plan that will address it not only from a slow perspective, but you include change management and awareness that is specific to that particular domain. If you're talking to developers, you might include secure coding, awareness sessions and training so they understand why it is important, how it happens. You show them certain things. You make sure that actually you help they work. You as well provide them the right tools so they can fix their codes before penetration testing so they could look very good. And then yeah. they feel proud about it. So again, it's all about putting yourself in the shoes of the person who's going to have more restrictions and ensure that they find the balance between continuing to doing their activities properly and efficiently while you are increasing the security and the resilience of that particular department on the business overall. I, I totally agree. Uh, it's, you know, we need to change our mentality from wanting to just, oh, sorry, everything's falling. Uh, we, we need to change our mentality from wanting to just, you know, block, 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 but more of, hey, how can we help you achieve whatever you're doing, yeah. but still be secure in our environment? Yeah. I think that culture of we, though, like is super important and it's missing in a lot of places. It, it, very often what I've seen, particularly when I've been like assessing organizations, is that you have us versus them. Mm -hmm. right? And you'll have sort of the security team zealous about trying to protect and then complaining about the infrastructure people who in the eyes of the security people they just don't care it's not i don't think it's not that they don't care it's that they're measured on different things and trying to achieve an overall better security posture for the enterprise doesn't really seem it's kind of like it's implicit but it's not shared measured and shared across teams so you end up having security teams who are like trying to protect and defend. And then you've got infrastructure teams who could be measured on something like uptime. So you end up having these conflicting objectives and ultimately the enterprise suffers because things are known and left unpatched, for example. Um, that kind of comes down to leadership though, right? Um, yeah. Which is you kind of have to have that message coming from the top that we are all, we are all, trying to achieve something together. And yeah, I guess it's gonna be negotiation and balancing things along the way. Um, but Anne, I would like to add here as well, because uh, there is very, um, I would say there, are an there is an important number of situations that I have seen where there is a leadership in cybersecurity and there is a very, very low communication or mm -hmm. no communication at all. Oh. Now, if you, are as a human being working with other colleagues in other departments and you actually care about them they will care about you mm -hmm. so i'm going a little bit further into the human aspect of it but you are not a police man or woman right <laughs> amen to that sometimes <laughs> feels like it though yeah 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 exactly so i think that the fact to ensure that the leadership includes communication, includes really that um, more empathetic as well, you know, consideration rather than blaming, for example, for certain things, also trusting certain people. Mm -hmm. I mean, as well, seeing situations where uh, employees have been blamed about clicking on links. I mean, seriously, nowadays with the advanced phishing attacks, I mean, anyone could click on a link. So we cannot. Yeah. Yeah. As a cybersecurity industry, we cannot assume, first, that everyone else will understand why it's important. Second, that when we say it needs to be done, that they will be doing it if we don't communicate with them and we don't trust them. Yeah. It's all about the relationship. So build it first and then slowly, slowly you get the support of the whole company. Yeah. 
Um, also, looking at the time a little bit, uh, I actually would like to address another topic if and, and Faith are also okay with that. Cool. So, um, in the last few years, we've heard actually more and more about a new way of risk management uh, measurements, um, namely from going to from qualitative risk management to more quantitative risk management. And there are a couple of uh, governance bodies who are developing their own methods for it. Um, but yeah, I, I do see that most of my clients, at least, are not really focusing on it yet and still preferring the, the qualitative measure, uh, way of measuring things. Um, how do you look at this, Magda? Jennifer, I love the question. It's actually one of my passions uh, to ensure that cyber risk is actually uh, quantified. And mm -hmm. I have been working in the field for uh, some time now. Uh, and I would like to say it very clearly like that. Traditionally, qualitative methods have been used. You define cyber risk, high, low, medium, green, yellow, whatever color you want. Those are all subjective. Mm -hmm. I might feel that this risk is critical and I will put it red. What does it really mean? Yeah. If it's unrelated to the business yeah. or... If it feels to me, because I'm in cybersecurity, so all the, you know, risk, field, you should protect for all of them. Mm -hmm. So I think the quantitative approach and ensuring that you very clearly calculate eventual potential financial losses following the cyber attack is the best way that allows you to take an informed decision and an objective decision, not a subjective decision based on your risk profile or your emotions, experience, whatever. Or political, yeah, or a political agenda. That could also be the case. <laughs> of course, absolutely. Yeah. Completely subjective, yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I think, yeah, that this, this aspect, and just to as well close perhaps on the topic, like you mentioned, there are some governing body that started working on it, but it's not mature yet. And yeah. there is a lot of um, interest growing in the space. Um, but I would absolutely encourage anyone who is listening to this webinar to take a look at the research, go and really investigate because it's absolutely amazing way of identifying cyber risks in a different way and putting mm -hmm. some financial numbers to it, which makes the whole difference. And for cybersecurity professionals, that brings us from just showing colors and doing some, you know, how it's like yeah. painting to actually going into business talks yeah. and saying, if you don't invest this amount into cybersecurity, that's what you can lose. And that is, again, a very different conversation that any of the cybersecurity professionals might have. Yeah, it makes it way more transparent and also way more tangible for the board, actually, to understand uh, what is actually at risk. Absolutely. Yeah. So as a way of maybe kind of tying all this together, one of the things that seems to characterize your approach to your work and um, the domain of cyber and risk management is that you, you kind of shift the lines and the boundaries a bit, right? Um, and I know you've also done this in writing a book and we've, we've had some guests previously. I'm just, I always say it, full of admiration for people right, who write books. It's an amazing achievement. Um, Tell us a little bit about this book that you've written and what, what, what inspired you to do it? What inspired me is the current situation around cyber in general. Obviously, we are looking at many cyber awareness initiatives and we are still struggling with fundamental understanding of what is cyber risk. We talked about it today. Mm -hmm. So I have decided to write a book that is a story. It's a fiction. It's a romance, mm -hmm. but it actually addressed cybersecurity concept in a real way and not from the perspective that someone types on a, you know, <laughs> on a few keyboards and mm -hmm. they hack the FBI. <laughs> I'm so really have, curious yeah. <laughs> how risk management and romance tie together. <laughs> well, the, the main character is a woman hacker 
Mm -hmm. And uh, she is going through a journey. And while, you know, you read the book and you go through it, she as well shares certain things that people might not know. So the readers are supposed to learn and discover without even knowing that they're learning real cybersecurity. Wow. Sounds interesting. Thank you. And the romance, of course. I mean, what sells? Come on. (laughs) (laughs) We're loving it, right? We've got this sort of female protagonist, the, the, the the, the woman hacker. Know that you also do um, sort of community-based work around getting more girls, more women into security. Tell us a bit about that. It's a, it's a cause that's dear to us as well. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, women in cyber or women on cyber group that I found in Singapore is a nonprofit group that is supposed to help any woman, girls to get interested in cybersecurity or evolve in their cybersecurity career to more leadership positions. And that actually is very much as well why I realized that a book like I, the one that I just shared with you might be good because apparently women or girls um, tend to leave that science interest when they are 15. Mm-hmm. So you need to get to that crowd and ensure that the teenager girl will be interested and will see role models in cybersecurity that will make them dream and passionate about, you know, the life and what they can achieve. And that needs to happen from initiatives, activities, Mm -hmm. different kind of channels as well, where they go, what they do. So we need to go into the mainstream as well. So we're doing all kinds of things like we run uh, various activities from webinars, awards, but as well to catch the flag competitions or hackathons. And I always try to ensure that at the end of any initiative, there is something that is tangible that they get from scholarship, um, certification, um internship something that will help them and i'm extremely happy to say that the latest third edition of 2021 cta for girls in singapore um was phenomenally young so our winner is a 15 years Uh, girl a singaporean 15 years old girl fantastic fabulous talent I'm very proud and very happy to see such an interest. I mean, this sounds fantastic. Um, If someone out there hears this right now and is actually interested in participating, what would they need to do? How would they join that that association that you started? Well, first of all, just to Google Women on Cyber Singapore is a good start. And Mm -hmm. then, of course, there's a website, Women on Cyber, with the contact details. We are currently only operating in Singapore, but probably at the time of this webinar, we'll be already having uh, an association that will be having a broader reach uh, because again, the objective is really to scale Mm -hmm. and give those opportunities to girls anywhere in the world. And I say girls because I I am having a very good pipeline of activities (laughs) and trying to put my, uh, you know, um, targets into bringing a lot of more younger girls into this space so what's your target age group um that you operate with Uh, i don't have any you know target group (laughs) if you are 13 and you want to start understanding how what is hacking up to we have even 50 and 60 that as well participated so it is all depending on the individual we certainly want to make sure that everyone feels included and everyone feels supported so no limits you we so, just need motivation and passion sounds great so magda i have uh, i guess my final my final question would be what would be your the advice to your younger self when trying to join cyber risk management so um you know because we are also targeting more uh, newbies who want to join this space of cybersecurity. So what would you advise yourself had it been you X years ago? Well, I have a very specific scenario that led me actually to where I am today. I made the mistake by myself and I went to an organization as a very young CISO and I told them, 
oh, you need to change everything. <laughs> well, that didn't work very well because first of all, I didn't align immediately with the business priorities. Then of course, a change management again, you cannot just go and block everything that doesn't work. Yeah. And that is very clearly the advice I would give to anyone in cybersecurity and especially for any aspiring CISO or someone who's just starting the journey. Do not try to address everything at the same time. Have a roadmap and a plan and ensure especially and critically communication and change management mm -hmm. they need both to go in parallel. If not, you might burn yourself. And do you also consider it important for them to at least understand some technical aspects uh, of cyber security in, in order to articulate some of these things? Well, I would say, Faith, it all depends on the structure of the team. What I do not like hearing as a CISO, for example, if someone comes to me and tells me, oh, the whole factor is going to be hacked. No, I don't believe that for a second. Give me a very clear scenario. Why? How? What? Which area? Which uh, component might be hacked? And that is actually challenging in general. So if you are alone and you don't have that technical team that might actually bring you that visibility, I would advise to go beyond your comfort zone and try to understand and be more specific. If you have a team, find a way to discuss with them so you don't just go to the business stakeholders and tell them we have this risk, but I cannot explain it to you because I just tell you the whole company is going to be hacked. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we are almost out of time. I know we could mm -hmm. talk about this for ages, but Magda, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you with us. Um, I... I I all, it's not that I ever, you know, doubted that risk management was important. Deep down in my soul, I know it is. Um, but, you know, you gave a very pragmatic um, and, uh, in, for want of a better word, inspiring approach to it, right? In the terms of saying that there, there is a better way. Um, it, it, it's a way of rallying teams together, bringing people together, building relationships. Um, so... Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you for sharing that message. Wishing you every success with the book. Um, and we will post the link to Women on Cyber so that people can find you. Um, any closing messages, Jennifer and Faith, before we wrap up? Just one. What's the name of the book? Actually, the, the title of the book is Being Brave and then Vera Cyber Adventures. <laughs> thank you love it very cool <laughs> thank you so much you're most welcome thank you very much for having me it's again absolutely wonderful to see three amazing women in cyber and who tells there's no woman in cyber like let's show the word right <laughs> yeah like this is so many right <laughs> in one so anyway thank you to our Thanks, viewers everybody. and bye-bye bye-bye